Hello again, everybody, and welcome to our updated talk on hyperthyroidism. Now, I suggest watching my video on hypothyroidism before watching this one because it's going to kind of build off of uh, our talk on hypothyroidism. So um, these are both very important talks. Uh, you're going to run into thyroid problems um, fairly regularly uh, if you're working family practice or internal medicine. It, it comes up pretty frequently, so you can expect to get questions on this on the exam. As I mentioned in hypothyroid, uh, this tests a lot of basic science, and so having a good grasp of that basic science is going to be really useful for you. It'll cut down on the memorization. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos, and I thank all those of you who have already donated. Okay, this is what we're going to talk about. We'll just do a brief overview. Uh, we'll talk about the differential, how we work this up, and then we'll go into some of the more common causes of hyperthyroidism. I'm going to try to touch on most of them, but I'm going to give more attention to the more common causes. So hyperthyroidism is an elevation of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormones are T3 and T4. Uh, T3 is the most active form. T4 is the most prevalent form. T4 can be converted to T3. So it's going to be useful for you to know that physiology. I have a video on thyroid physiology, so you can go back and watch that. Uh, the symptoms of hyperthyroidism are the complete opposite of hypothyroidism. So instead of being depressed, they're going to be nervous. That can actually go even go into mania. Um, so if you've got a patient coming in with mania, you always got to check that thyroid. Go back to my psych talks. You'll see ev pretty much everything. You're going to be getting a thyroid lab. Uh, emotional ability, again, kind of like the mania there. Tremor, insomnia, sweating as a, uh, and heat intolerance as opposed to cold intolerance. Weight loss despite increased appetite. So this is different, total opposite from hypothyroidism, where you have weight gain despite uh, decreased appetite. Palpitations, warm and moist skin as opposed to cold and dry skin. Menstrual changes, that's seen in hypothyroidism too. And you can even get hypercalcemia. Now, primary hyperthyroidism, like primary hypothyroidism, is a problem with the thyroid. So this is elevated thyroid hormone due to increased autonomous production by the thyroid. And so as a consequence, because you have increased thyroid hormone, there's going to be increased negative feedback on the hypothalamus and pituitary. Consequently, you're going to have a low TSH. So we see low TSH and high free T4. Secondary hyperthyroidism is elevated thyroid hormone due to increased stimulation by TSH. Okay, by TSH. So what then you have is an elevated TSH and an elevated free T4. These, this is just a nice little cartoon showing kind of the symptoms. If you're a visual person, maybe this will help. Big one that I didn't mention is diarrhea. That can certainly happen. Okay, so your differential. Uh, remember that when you suspect thyroid symptoms, either hypo or hyper, best thing to do is get a TSH. Certainly you're gonna get a T4 level, free T4 level, and you may get a T3 level, but the TSH is probably the most important. If they ask you what's the best next step in the diagnosis of this patient, it's gonna be TSH. But if you're taking CCS, for instance, yeah, you're gonna get your TSH and free T4 at the same time. You're not gonna wait. The differential for hyperthyroidism is primary hyperthyroidism, secondary hyperthyroidism. There are various causes of that. We're going to be talking about causes of primary hyperthyroidism here. Pheochromocytoma can certainly cause the nervousness, the tremors, the sweating, the anxiety. Um, that's a problem with the adrenal gland. Acute manic episode, cocaine intoxication, amphetamine intoxication. Use your judgment if they're coming into the ER and the... The salient symptom is mania or psychosis, um, then you may think along those lines. But again, I've told you this a million times, if you have a psychiatric picture, you're going to be getting a thyroid hormone TSH level 
no matter what. Um, certainly, if you are suspecting cocaine or amphetamine to intoxication, urine drug screen is going to be important there. Differential. So primary hyperthyroidism, uh, number of causes. These are going to be what we go into here. Secondary hyperthyroidism, I'm just going to point out pituitary adenoma and amiodarone induced hyperthyroidism. Pretty easy to go based on the history uh, with the medication here. Um, with a pituitary adenoma, these tend to be small tumors as opposed to the tumors that can cause hypothyroidism. So you're probably not going to see a bitemporal hemianopsia here. Um, so if you have a high TSH and a high T3, T3 and T4, then you'll want to CT these patients and probably MRI. Okay, Graves' disease is the number one cause of primary hyperthyroidism. It's very common. Uh, so what happens here is that you have antibodies that are made that stimulate the thyroid. Now these are not, this is not TSH. So if you measure TSH, it's gonna be low because of the negative feedback. So what you have here are antibodies that stimulate the thyroid. These are called thyrotropin stimulating immunoglobulins and you can measure this in lab. Uh, so this, like I said, is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism in the US. Like most autoimmune or antibody mediated disorders, it's gonna be more prevalent in women, about seven to eight cases in women to every one case in men, and it tends to be in younger women. You see this pattern with these autoimmune disorders. It is associated with other autoimmune disorders. Here we're talking HLA-B8. Know that for step one. The symptoms are going to be consistent with uh, hyperthyroidism. You can also get uh, exophthalmos. That is not due to hyperthyroidism. That's fairly unique to Graves' disease. And this is due to a deposition of glycosaminoglycans in the retroorbital tissue. Um, so uh, you, I'll show you a picture of that. Um, this is fairly specific for Graves. Physical exam, it's going to be consistent with hyperthyroidism. Best initial test is a TSH level, like any thyroid etiology that you're thinking. Most accurate test is serology for those TSIs. So get a thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin. Other labs, a CBC may show a normocytic anemia just due to the inflammation. Um... The uh, BMP may show a hypercalcemia, and that's because T3 activates osteoclasts. So uh, look for that. The best initial therapy is first going to be symptomatic. So we give propranolol. That'll help control the symptoms. And then the more definitive treatment, we go medical first. Um, so we'll give antithyroid drugs. PTU uh, or methimazole are fine. Methimazole tends to be preferred in non-pregnant people. Uh, however, PTU can also be given, but I would go with methimazole if you're dealing with a man or a non-pregnant woman. Make sure and get a pregnancy test though before you start it. PTU is what you would give if the woman is indeed pregnant in the first trimester. The definitive therapy is radioiodine ablation. Now, radioiodine should not be used in children or pregnant women. Instead, you would do a subtotal thyroidectomy or you would just treat it symptomatically until you can do something else. PTU is the antithyroid drug of choice in pregnant women in the first trimester. Uh, it is... Uh, Methimazole is teratogenic, as we'll go into. Graves ophthalmopathy uh, may not respond to antithyroid treatment. You may give steroids, or there's a new drug that was approved in 2020 called Tepeza. You might see it on commercials if you live in the U.S. The generic for that is Tepratumumab. Um, that's probably not going to come up on a test question. Uh, another thing, it's pretty low yield. Um, if you're trying to distinguish Graves from thyroiditis, um, let's say you had a negative TSI, you can look at the T3 to T4 ratio. I doubt you'll be tested on that, but it's good to know. This is goiter. Um, so obvious, this is a pretty obvious case here. Um, you know, it, it really just depends on the severity though. This is the exophthalmos. These are mild cases, believe it or not. And then these are obviously very severe cases. This is pretibial myxedema. You get this um, for similar reasons that you get uh, the exophthalmos. Now, if you were to do a radioiodide uh, uptake scan, 
so the radioactive iodide uptake, RAIU, uh, what you would see in Graves' disease is a confluent increase uptake. And the reason for that is because the whole thyroid is being affected, as opposed to if you had a nodule or multiple nodules, you would only see bits and pieces of the thyroid being affected. So this confluent increase uptake is what you would see, or it might be described as diffuse. Now, toxic nodular goiter comes in a couple different flavors. Um, so again, you have hyperthyroid symptoms and goiter here. Uh, what you may appreciate is a single nodule, which is an adenoma, a toxic adenoma, or you may have multiple nodules, which would be toxic multinodular goiter. Toxic adenoma tends to be in patients under 40 to 50, so think young adults, uh, middle-aged, toxic multinodular goiter tends to be in older adults, over 50. The best initial test here, because we're dealing in hyperthyroid, is a TSH level. The most accurate test, if you believe you have a nodule or nodules, is going to be that RAIU scan. Um, so sometimes you can feel these nodules by palpation, other times you can't. Um, although the symptoms are similar to Graves' disease, in Graves, you're going to have a confluently enlarged thyroid uh, as opposed to nodular goiter, where you're going to feel nodules in many cases. The treatment is going to be very similar here. It's propranolol for symptoms. The treatment of choice, however, more definitively, is radioactive iodine therapy. And the surgery is done if there is a mass effect. So if there is any kind of compression on the esophagus or trachea, for instance, or if there's a suspicion for malignancy, we'll go into that. Um, or if it's unresponsive to medical treatment. There is no need to biopsy these nodules because carcinomas of the thyroid are non-functional. Okay, uh, so this is the same picture we already saw. With toxic multinodular goiter, we'll see increased uptake in these various nodules. So notice here you see th at least three. Uh, with a toxic adenoma, you're only going to see one. Okay, now when you do that RAIU scan, you might see cold nodules. So your warm nodules or hot nodules are going to look like this, areas of increased uptake. Cold nodules will show areas of decreased uptake, and you may see that in addition to hot nodules. So what that means then is that with these cold nodules, you may have to go in with an FNA. Okay, and that's a fine needle aspiration, which would be the next step in a cold nodule. And ultimately, you may need to remove these because these indeed may be a sign of thyroid cancer. However, if you're just dealing with hot nodules, you do not need to biopsy that. Now, thyroiditis comes in a few different flavors as well. Uh, there's subacute, or also called Decurvain's thyroiditis, postpartum thyroiditis, Riedel's thyroiditis, which uh, is um, very unique, as we'll get to, um, and then Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is a cause of hypothyroidism. However, when you have acute inflammation, very early Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you can get a hyperthyroid phase, and that's called Hashitoxicosis. All of these can present with a transient hyperthyroidism. They will commonly, all of these will commonly go on to a hypothyroid state. Now, um, the diagnosis here um, is you're going to start out again with that TSH level. If you're dealing in hyperthyroidism, the TSH is going to be low. These will be primary hyperthyroidisms. Now, if you are suspecting Graves, you're going to get a TSI. Um, and if uh, you are suspecting anything else, you'll get an REIU scan. Now, the uptake in thyroiditis is going to be low because the thyroid gland is damaged, and that differentiates it from Graves and nodular disease, which we already talked about, where they're, it's going to be either confluently uh, increased uptake in Graves or nodular uh, uptake in the nodular disorders. Now, some clues. If you have hyperthyroidism and a low RAIU, so Go back here. It looks something, oh, we don't have it. Something like this. Here we go. Um, so notice you have decreased uptake relative to normal. 
then what you want to do is look at the history. So if it's a painful thyroid, you're probably dealing with a subacute thyroiditis or decurvanes thyroiditis. If you are less than a year postpartum, then you might be dealing with postpartum thyroiditis. If you have a rock hard thyroid, a rocky, tough thyroid, um, then what you may be dealing with is a Riedel thyroiditis. And this can get really bad, and this can actually impinge upon local structures. And then if you have a positive anti-TPO, then you're probably dealing with Hashi toxicosis. And so that actually also should be part of your initial workup, I would suggest, is to get an anti-TPO. Now, factitious hyperthyroidism is when you have a person who's taking thyroid medication and they shouldn't be. So if they're taking levothyroxine and they shouldn't be. These patients, uh, you know, they may be doing it for a variety of reasons. Some people will get their hands in it because they want to lose weight. Thyroid hormone will make you lose weight really fast. Or they may be doing it for medical attention. So you're talking here about, um, you know, a psychiatric issue. Um, so, and that could be malingering. It could be, you know, something else. Um, so you need to consider the history there. Either way, we're going to be working these patients up. You get a TSH level. And then what you'll do is you'll get a thyroglobulin level. And that is going to be low in factitious hyperthyroidism. And the treatment here is going to be obviously to stop taking the medication and to do psychotherapy. Okay, so some notes about pregnant patients. In the first trimester, PTU is preferred to methimazole. Either are fine at low to moderate doses for lactating women. That RAIU scan that we talked about, contraindicated in pregnant women. Wait till they deliver, then work them up. Hyperthyroidism that develops within a year postpartum should raise suspicion for postpartum thyroiditis. Do not use methimazole in the first trimester. We already talked about this. Why? It causes aplasia cutis, which is where you have a localized lack of development of the dermis and epidermis. And usually in about 70 to 80% of cases, it's going to be localized to the scalp. And so you see this here. There'll be areas where there's a loss of hair, loss of skin. Um, this is why we don't give methimazole in the first trimester. This is something I made for you, and uh, you can print this out if you want. It's basically everything we talked about. And here's another table. All right. So to recap, hyperthyroidism shows up with anxiety, heat tolerance, insomnia, weight loss, despite normal food intake. You can also see tremor, excessive sweating, and occasionally exophthalmos, particularly with graves, which is the number one cause. The best initial diagnostic test is a TSH, will help you determine whether you're dealing with primary or secondary, and it can also rule out non-thyroid causes of some of those symptoms that overlap. Uh, further testing is with RAIU scan and TSI titers. Primary hyperthyroidism, you got a low TSH and a high T4. Secondary hyperthyroidism is a high TSH and high T4. If you're dealing with primary hyperthyroidism, um, Think about Graves and getting that uh, those those labs for Graves. Um, that's the TSI, by the way. Uh, if you're dealing with secondary hyperthyroidism, get an MRI. Several causes, but the most common is Graves' disease. That's going to be pri primary hyperthyroidism with a, a positive TSI and a diffusely increased radioactive uh, iodine uptake scan. The treatment for hyperthyroid symptoms is propranolol. That's symptomatic treatment. That's not going to treat the underlying disorder. Mild cases can be treated with antithyroid medications, PTU, uh, or methimazole. Methimazole for most people, PTU for people that don't respond to methimazole, or for all pregnant women in the first trimester. Definitive treatment is thyroidectomy. We want to avoid that, though, uh, because then we're going to have to put these patients on levothyroxine for the rest of their life. Avoid, again, I can't stress this enough, avoid methimazole in the first trimester. Like I said, causes aplasia cutis in the fetus. We want to avoid that unless you enjoy going before a court of law.